raising foster kittens is one of the most rewarding things that you can do and there are so many that need your love but it can be intimidating if you've never done it before and you don't know how to care for them so it's a good job that we've got people like nancy peterson from the national kitten collective to talk to us about why and how to raise foster kittens nancy it's wonderful to be talking to you today about a topic that i have unfortunately, a lot of experience with in, in my area, which is uh, raising foster kittens, orphan kittens, the problems that they face, keeping them healthy uh, and, and troubles with that population. But I'd love to know a little bit of your background and what brought you into to this field, because as I understand it, you're a veterinary technician. You worked in the Humane Society of the United States. So, yeah, how did your career develop to you know find yourself involved in this area? Sure. Well, as a child, I wanted to be a zookeeper, but everybody poo pooed that. They said, oh, do you know how dirty that is? How dangerous that is? How difficult that is? So I studied anthropology and archaeology and loved it. But really, my heart was with the animals. So I did go back to school to get a degree in veterinary technology. And I worked as a veterinary technician for 12 and a half years in San Diego, California, similar climate to probably New Zealand. And I then, oh, I trained dogs for people with disabilities other than blindness. And then I moved cl close to our capital, Washington, D.C. And I worked for the largest animal protection organization, the Humane Society of the United States. I was their cat programs manager. And when I retired in 2015, I moved to a small mountain town in western Colorado of 6,900 people. And I love fostering kittens for my local animal shelter. And I'm also on the boards of several animal welfare organizations. My principal one that I do the most work for as a board member and writer and editor is the National Kitten Coalition. Yeah, fantastic. So a wealth of professional experience and also personal experience in the, yeah. the nitty and gritty of getting up in the middle of the night and, and feeding kittens and things, which I'm sure we're going to come on to um, in, a, in a little bit. So if we're thinking then about the, these kittens, what, you know, what is the problem? Why, why is this something that we even should be talking about? Why are we, you know, here today, I guess? Right, because everybody loves kittens, but yeah. there are just too many of them and there aren't enough homes for them. So certainly kittens who are born outdoors may suffer if no one is caring for them other than their mama kitty. A mama kitty will try to do a very good job, but there are so many dangers outdoors and so many kittens will not make it. And, you know, that is just heartbreaking. So we, we do need to spay and neuter our pet cats and we can do that. Fortunately, as early as two months of age or two or, or or two pounds, sorry, two pounds, yes, two pounds and two months of age is what our our animal shelters and rescues are doing. The veterinary community doesn't really need to do that for pet cats, but pet cats we're hoping can be spayed by five months of age because females can, as you know, come into heat as early as four months of age, yeah, you know, absolutely. kittens having kittens. We just don't want that. So the best thing is to prevent the birth of unwanted kittens so that the kittens who are born will have a loving home. Yeah, absolutely. And I guess, you know, we talk about that age uh, and, and spay neutering isn't really the, the main focus of our conversation, but it's such an important one to to nip this problem in the in the bud. One thing that I am aware of in the research that's done is that people, you know, for, for pet owning um, families that they may think, oh, you know, they plan to get their, their cat de-sexed. But that six months, five months comes around very quickly. And so there are a lot of accidental births Oops. if you like as well yes and it might not seem like that's much of a problem but you know we've got to find homes for all of these kittens we've got to find good homes loving homes uh, so that that cycle isn't repeated so actually that early early neutering is very important and unlike our dogs people may be aware that there's issues with timings of of desexing our dogs there doesn't yes. seem to be those issues with cats at all so it's something that's to right. definitely that's jump right. on sooner rather than rather than later that's right. No physical or detrimental behavior consequences yeah. of spaying, neutering cats at these young ages. 
Yeah. So so we've got these cats that are being born in the wild or, you know, they're they're being in barns. They don't really have good uh, a good owner situation. There's no pet parent looking out for their well-being. What kind of challenges are they facing in that those early weeks and, and months of life? Well, if no one has been caring for mom cat, it's likely that she hasn't had the best nutrition. So now you have a mom cat giving birth to kittens who haven't had the best prenatal care, if you will. Yeah. And and then mom has the challenge of feeding herself and getting enough nutrition so that she can care for her kittens. The outdoors can be a very dangerous place. As you know, there are predators, there are poisons, there are other cats to fend off. There is weather. It's just not the ideal place to be raising a family. And so unfortunately, the mortality rate, at least here in the United States, is very high, maybe 65%. And then yeah. you've got kittens who you need to find homes for. Or if you don't get to them soon enough, and they were born to a mom who was very unsocialized, you may not be able to place them in a loving home because they're not suitable as pet cats. So then you have to find a stable, a barn, someplace for them. And it's just not easy here in the United States. The shelters and rescues are overwhelmed with kittens. Yeah, wow. I think it's the same the world the world over. And certainly here in, in New Zealand, we have a number locally. I have a number of um, kind of rescue and foster organizations and they're always bursting at the seams. And it also seems to me, and I don't know what your experience is, Nancy, but we used to think typically of the kitten season, you know, kind of late spring, summer. But we're finding that we have a, we're having kittens born almost year round. So it's almost ne it's a never ending problem. Right. In many parts of the United States, that is the case as well. However, in in areas such as the mountains of Colorado, where I live or places where you have severe winters, yeah. The cats are not having kittens at this time of year when it is so cold yeah, and, yeah. and there's such a, a lack of resources, resources. and yeah. survival would be very minimal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, at least you, I guess so that that's really the the mission of the national coalition, the national kitten coalition, which is to increase kitten survival rates through education. We want to provide fosters, whether they're doing it on their own or through a shelter or a rescue, whether it's a veterinary clinic, whether it's anyone who's out there caring for kittens, we want to give them the resources that they need so that the kittens will survive. And we do that through education. And our website at kittencoalition.org has lots and lots of free blog articles and webinars. We even have an online kitten conference in June and our online veterinary conference is coming up on October the 8th. So we are passionate about saving more kittens and we hope that anyone who's listening is as well and can just log on to our website and take advantage of all of our all of our resources, I'm sure, as you know, when you probably went to veterinary school, when I went to vet tech school, we didn't learn anything about pediatric and neonatal care. No, and so nothing. if I brought you a neonatal kitten and you didn't have experience with a rescue or a shelter, you probably didn't see kittens till they were adopted at eight weeks of age. Well, you might not really know what to do with a neonate. So we really are out there trying to also educate the veterinary community because they are critical to this to yeah. this effort to save kittens. Yeah, absolutely. But yes, and there is a lot of work that goes on, I guess, behind the scenes and through the School of Hard Knocks, you know, for people who haven't come across the the resources that you have to offer, uh, who, you know, just get stuck in and think, you know, I've got a number of vet nurses who are, are passionate about cats in general but raising these kittens and, and trying to find homes for them i you know i hate to think of the number of of stray cats that we rehome through our clinic because they come to us with no home maybe you know not particularly unwell but not doing that great and then we we nurse them back to health and then find homes for them so there's a lot of 
a lot of people working very hard in the background as well. And, you know, I, I think just for taking a little break and, and uh, sing out to all of the, the veterinary clinics out there working on this behind the scenes. You know, there's a lot of a lot in the press at the minute. I was just reading another um, piece where a vet is being hounded online for 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 no reason at all, effectively. Um, and there's a lot of negativity, but there's an awful lot of good work that, that gets done that people aren't aware of. So um, anyway, that's that's by the by, Nancy. <laughs> If we're thinking about how we can raise these kittens, how we can can nurse them, not just so that they survive, but so that they thrive, that really is something that is very possible and that anyone can do. Like you say, what's what's the first step in in you know raising a healthy kitten? Knowledge, <laughs> knowing <laughs> what to do, right? And yeah. and so very important. I you know. I was I was scared to foster my first kittens and I have never fostered bottle babies kittens who I have to be nursed with a bottle and stimulated to urinate. I, I do feel that I could do it, but it's so much more intensive because depending on their age, you are waking up every few hours, they have to yep. be fed, they have to be stimulated to eliminate. And the older I get, the you know, the the more I need an interrupted sleep. So I I foster the for the weaned kittens, meaning they can eat solid food, and I thoroughly enjoy it. And everything that I've learned from the National Kitten Coalition has helped me to be a better foster. It's it's how I've learned to recognize. Uh oh as well as my background, of course, as a veterinary technician, something's not right with this kitten. It's it's helped me to understand not just medically, but part of the very important part of so, of, of fostering is socializing them. If they're from outdoors and they haven't had much contact with people, they may be frightened of people. They may be frightened of toys. They're frightened of things that they're unfamiliar with, which, which even includes your foster kitten room. So, so you have to gradually gain their trust. I'm, I'm really a fan of letting them set the pace. I don't force myself on them, but I lure them with treats and wand toys. And pretty soon, I mean, it could, well, I'll say pretty soon, it could take three weeks before they're yeah. lying in my legs and comfortable and rolling over. But it, that, and that's the most rewarding to me is taking a kitten who is frightened and doesn't trust people and turning them into a little love bug that yeah. would, you know, just be a wonderful, wonderful pet in somebody's home. Yeah, absolutely. What the rewarding work. And it doesn't always take that three weeks. Sometimes they come around much faster. I guess it depends yes. on that, the the mother's yeah. situation, if there was a mother and and what exactly. those early, early weeks in, involved. I guess talking about whether there's a mother or not, does that make a difference to the work that needs to be done? I mean, obviously we think of feeding, but um, is there anything else? that we need to think about with regards whether the mother's present or not? Well, the mother teaches the kittens so much. And whether the mother is afraid of you, uh, that can get transmitted to the kittens as well. So sometimes, you know, when there's a, a, a feral, I'll say a very feral mother, it, it might not be fair, I would say, to keep her confined with the kittens. Yeah. Although... She can give the best care if she's so stressed out, she might not be able to give the best care. But yes, mothers, mother cats can do the job so much better than a surrogate human mother. They, you know, they can nurse them any time of the day or night. They keep them clean. They stimulate them. They teach them to use the litter box, although really nobody needs to teach a kitten to use litter box if you provide the appropriate material they will use it and you know she cleans them and when the kittens are together that's so important too because they learn how to to modify it will say their behavior so they're not being too rough with their siblings so when when yeah. they're really playing rough and one of them Okay, that was a little I'll back off. And 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 mom starts this kitten starts seeing that mom's eating food and they'll imitate her. So having a mom is is really wonderful. I've had three moms with kittens that I've fostered and it's just been delightful. They've been wonderful moms and to see how well they take care of their kittens 
The sad part is when the kittens go back to the shelter, they fly out the door. And mom cat is waiting and waiting yeah. for her chance for a good home. But ultimately, the cats that have fostered have all been adopted. Yeah, wonderful. So that's a happy ending all all round, yeah, I guess. Absolutely. Um, absolutely. Just jumping back into that stimulation to toilet. So I think that's something that a lot of people won't be aware of is a need for for young animals, for, for most young animals. Um, can you talk to us a little bit more about what you mean by that? Sure. Sure. So nature, nature is very intelligent. Kittens cannot urinate and defecate on their own because that's a way to keep the nest clean. If the nest is dirty, it could attract predators. So mom cat has to actually lick the genitals and the anus of the kitten to get them to stimulate, to get them to urinate and defecate. She eats it and it's all clean and nice. So when we people are acting as moms, then we have to take a very soft, maybe cotton ball or a cloth or a tissue. And before they we feed them, if they're bottle babies, because they 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 need to be stimulated till they're about four weeks of age. After that time, they can go to the bathroom on their own. Yeah. So yes, until that time, if we are caring for them, we have to take a little soft cloth and gently put it on their their privates and not rub it because that would be very irritating. But we actually make contact with the skin and we kind of just move it around in a circle and we keep doing that until they have finished urinating and defecating. Now they'll usually urinate every time that they're stimulated, but they may not defecate every time, maybe every 12 to 24, sometimes even 36 hours, depending on how much they're eating. Yeah. Yeah. And it's important to be very gentle, like you say there, because it's easy okay. to get carried away and you can it, it can get a little bit sore, sore back oh, there if um, if we're doing it too enthusiastically. But such a, exactly. such an important thing to do, because the last thing we want is yeah. um, a massively full bladder and a very constipated and, and unwell. Oh, well. yes. unwell and kitten. One, one other thing that is so important, I, I'm kind of the, you know, the social media police woman, I see kittens <laughs> being nursed on their back. And that is a definite, definite no, no. We don't feed kittens on their back as we would human babies because we risk them aspirating the formula, which means instead of going into their stomach, it goes into their lungs and kittens can die from that. Yeah. 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 So we're, I mean, we're trying to replicate nature in a way and the kitten will always be on their legs kind of nuzzling into, into mum so we can get them in that position and, and, and feed them that way. And, and with feeding them, them, Nancy, when we're thinking of bottle raising our kittens, how often are we having to feed them and how is that changing as they are, are growing and maturing and, and hopefully the, the, the sleepless nights get less and less. Right. Right. So, you know, it mostly depends on their weight, not so much their age, because you could have a poorly nourished kitten who is five weeks old, but only has the stomach capacity of a two week old kitten. So there's really wonderful information. Well, there's some on our website. We have a, a wonderful nonprofit called Maddie's Fund. And it does provide a wonderful stomach capacity chart according to weight of the kitten. So it'll tell you this is how much a kitten weighing this much should eat every day. And this is how often, you know, divide this up into six or eight feedings a day because their stomach has just so much capacity. Yeah. Uh, that's why you don't get to sleep too much. <laughs> but it does get better as the kitten gets a little older. Yeah, yeah. No, it's um it is yeah, those early stages are very hard work. I remember um oh, a long time ago now we we my wife and I were in India at a, a rescue organization and we had a, a bunch of puppies, not kittens, but at that age they're all little bundles of fluff that need kind of the same care. And uh, there was a number of uh, a number of other volunteers there and we had I think we took turns for two nights in a row and or oh, I mean after that I was pretty exhausted but it's right? it's incredibly rewarding and you can almost see them growing before your very eyes as oh, well you can you can I love I have a a 
a chart that shows week by week how they should be behaviorally and physically maturing. And I just love seeing that every week. Oh, you know, this is the week they're going to start playing with each other. This is the week they'll be focused on toys. This is the week that X is going to happen. And it is just fascinating. Yeah, hitting those milestones, much like we, you know, look for with our with our human children as as well. Yes, yes, yes. yes. I love spending so, time with my fosters. I love taking pictures of them. And all my friends come and visit when I have foster kittens. <laughs> Obviously to see you as well, Nancy, not just the kittens. <laughs> I don't know about that. <laughs> I get more, more visitors when I have my kittens. Yeah. So if we're then we're so we've we've got through that bottle feeding, how are we introducing solids to them? Because you say with mum, they you know they they naturally see mum eating and and take right. those cues. If mum isn't present, well, I wonder what age that happens at, and also if if mum isn't there, how are we introducing foods to them? So I would say at about at about five weeks of age, five, six weeks of age, mom is going to start backing off on offering the milk bar to them because she's getting pretty exhausted yeah. herself. And so if there is no mom, then we as caregivers, and, and sometimes we, we get them four weeks of age and, and they can they can go on to solid food, so but we have to introduce it very gradually. Their digestive systems are very sensitive at that point. And so we're going to make a gruel for them, which is kitten, moist kitten food, probably with some water in it. And it's going to be like a soup because at this point, yeah. all they know is probably how to suck. They don't know how to lap things up. So at first, it's pretty funny. They're kind of you know sucking up their food they, they they've never eaten from a bowl they've never or a dish i would say so, so we introduce this gruel in a very shallow dish and i like to put some on a little baby plastic spoon and you know offer it to them uh and and let them get a little taste of it and they're going oh okay hey that's interesting and then we feed them some more. And then eventually I will lower the spoon down to the dish. And oh, oh, okay. And it can be pretty messy because they don't realize they're not supposed to be, be stepping yeah. in their food. <laughs> and then and then, you know, as the days go by, I will add less and less water to this mixture so that hopefully by the time they're eight weeks of age, ready to be adopted into a home, they're eating their canned or wet food. Yeah, wonderful. Yeah, just that slow process and and taking your time and yes, being prepared for the mess because cats are generally very clean animals, but not at that stage when we're introducing food. I guess they're a bit like the toddler where you need the the bib and a plastic sheet on the ground as well because it goes everywhere. Exactly. And here in the states, we I, I believe it's a Japanese product. It's made by a company called Inaba, and it's called Churu C H U R U. I call it a lickable treat. It comes in a little tube and you can squeeze the end. I have never met a cat or a kitten that did not love that. And they <laughs> actually make a kitten formula. Okay. And so I use that a lot. Sometimes I'll mix that in with the gruel or lead them to the bowl with that. I use that a lot for socialization. And perhaps I use, I never try to wrap them in a towel or put them in a bowl to weigh them on a little scale. They want to get off. They jump out. I get so frustrated. <laughs> I just take a dab of churu, put it right on the scale. And, and then I have to deal with everybody wants to get on the scale. <laughs> so, but it's a great way to weigh them. So I don't know, you probably have some form of a lip lickable treat. And I encourage people to use those yeah. as well They're yeah wonderful. work with them don't don't fight them no no because you can subdue them and force them to submit but that doesn't teach them to trust you or that people are good so the best way is to work with them and food and play are wonderful motivators at that age absolutely absolutely and i think that's 
become a big change in the you know from my point of view in the veterinary industry as a whole is the the fear free movement and working with our oh, patients yeah. rather than you know just getting the job done which you know you go back 15 20 years would have been would have been the case but also pet parents would have been upset if you'd said well let's we'll come back another time and try it a different way they expected the job to be done but thankfully that's not the case and and we've got much happier patients in in the vet clinic absolutely with, with, yeah with them um, thinking so that that's we've got them we've got them feeding we've got them toileting they're growing they're developing they're socially maturing and they're becoming loving kittens is there anything that we're doing for preventive health at this early stage before they're rehomed well the i i am i foster through my local animal shelter and certainly they are vaccinating them as early as four weeks of age and worming them as early as two weeks of age because internal parasites can really take their toll on a kitten's health. And so if you are, are fostering through a rescue or a shelter, then they will set up the schedule for the kittens to, and I yeah. bring them back, they get weighed. Although I weigh them every day, that's part of the deal. We have to make sure they're gaining weight they're not gaining weight that's often the first sign that something's not right so yes they have to have vaccinations and they get them every few weeks because as you know they if they had the first milk the the fluid the colostrum from their their mom then they've gotten some maternal antibodies and but we don't know for each kitten when those stop being effective stop interfering with the vaccination and that's why kittens and puppies and babies <laughs> all need a series of vaccinations and also series of wormings and then here in the united states kittens at it depends on the state but usually it's 14 weeks of age minimum a rabies vaccination so yeah there's there's a lot going on when they're that young and then of course in a year in a kitten's life, you know, a one-year-old cat is a 15-year-old in a human life. And so we we really stress they must see the veterinarian at least once a year when they're seniors, probably two times a year, because a lot can go on as their their systems are starting to slow down. But but I'm so glad you mentioned fear free because yeah, what I was a vet tech. We scruffed, we stretched them out, you know, to restrain them. And my God, we were we were just scared. No wonder kittens and cats didn't like to go to the veterinarian. Look what we did to them. We just yeah. terrified them. Yeah. So so I'm so glad that that and and cats are often the underdogs. You know, first it was the dogs who were cared for and the dog foods that were that were created and the dog vaccines and dog, 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 dog. And I love dogs, but cats have always played second fiddle in my opinion. And so I'm just really, really happy that cats are getting their due now and people want to understand cats more so that they can live happier lives. Yeah, absolutely. And it may be a, a shock to all of the cat lovers out there, but actually from a uh, a veterinary spend point of view or a healthcare spend point of view people spend a lot more on dogs than than cats so yeah they i think they still play second fiddle but there's the more appreciation i guess for the benefits that they bring bring to us and and potentially the easier time they give us for for being owners as well um there's yeah less intense need to to care for them later on in life from the walking and all that kind of thing as well right and i think part part of the you see cats at the veterinarian less is because <laughs> they don't go in cars that often and they don't have to get stuffed in a carrier that often. And, and that is so scary and people can't do it and, and it stresses them as well. So there are wonderful ways to acclimate cats to their carriers and make them safe places so that it's not such an ordeal to take your cat to the veterinarian. There are also some wonderful drugs that have been developed now, like gabapentin. And if your cat doesn't have, I think it's kidney problems, then it's such a safe, a safe drug to give to chill your cat out in the car and even at the veterinarian's office. So yeah, there, there's there's a lot being done and I'm very grateful for that. Yeah. Yeah, but, and, but well, even I, at the early, even at the early stage for our fostering, if we're getting them used to 
exactly. the carriers or when we're bringing them home, having just been fostered and we're adopting them, getting used to the carriers, maybe, you know, just going in the car, the engine on, and then you go out the car. It's mm -hmm. all these little things that we're doing in these very early stages of life can make a it's, huge difference. It's, it's, they do. And, and one negative experience can really set you back. Yeah. So it's important to avoid those at all costs. Yeah, because yeah, cats are very clever. That's for sure. Yes, that's for they, sure. They are. They are. They so are. Nancy, we've covered an awful lot of ground, but we have also only just scratched the surface. I think we've given a really lovely no overview. Intended. Yeah. No <laughs> well, my, my, my son would have been very proud of that pun. Uh, <laughs> oh, that was a good one. <laughs> um, where where can people go online? We mentioned you mentioned some of those resources uh, for for people who find themselves in this situation. I guess where can can people continue this education, uh, and maybe where can they find support, and how can they get involved as well if they're thinking, well, I've never I've never fostered kittens, but there is a problem in my area, or I wonder if there is, and I'd love to to jump into this rewarding activity. Where how can people start? Before I tell you that, there's one thing I want to say that I feel is so, so important. Good Samaritans who find kittens, the first thing they want to do is feed them. That can kill them. If they are cold, their digestion, their digestive system cannot absorb the food that they're going to feed them, and it can actually kill them. So, Please, if you find a kitten, the first thing you have to do, you have to warm up the kitten and it's not enough to hold them close to your body. So check out our website. We have critical care for kittens, which includes low body temperature, low blood sugar, dehydration. And we have fleas and kittens can get, you know, sucked, sucked of their blood by a, a huge flea infestation. Those things can kill them. Yeah, so check that, out our website kitcoalition.org look at all the wonderful articles that have been written and not just the articles if you go to the end of each article there are wonderful resources if you're a pet parent if you're a shelter or rescue if you're a veterinary professional we want to give you other resources that you can dive in deeper but we definitely give you the most critical information that you need and you're going to learn about things about cats you didn't even know existed i learned things as well kittens born without an anus. I mean, it's just incredible what can happen. I, I never had children. Maybe that happens with human children as well. But yeah, I was like, what? So you, you will learn a lot. As I said, education saves lives. Also, our webinars are free. And, and if you follow us on social media, you'll get lots and lots of fun tips. And that's just Facebook or LinkedIn or what other social media channels you follow. We're really trying to, to get the word out there. We've been attending veterinary conferences. And the last one I attended was in July, the American Veterinary Medical Association, and almost nobody had heard of us. And I was like, yes, <laughs> that's right. That's why we're here. When they heard about our resources, they were so excited. So the more people who know about our resources, share our resources, the more kittens will be saved. And that's Absolutely. what we're here for. And what a wonderful mission. I think that's something that everyone can can jump behind and 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 work towards and appreciate the amazing work that you're doing. So Nancy, thank you so much for for joining us for this wonderful conversation. We could talk about kittens all day, I know, but um yeah, thank you for the work that you're doing. And I know this is going to make a huge difference to the survival of, of so many kittens in the future. And there are so many cats and kittens out there that need our love. And unfortunately, many do end up either stray or feral living out on the streets. But this is a problem that there is a solution for, which I dive into in this video linked on screen. So tap on that video. And until then, I'm veterinarian Dr. Alex. This is Our Pets Health, because they're family.